Two announcements before the homily. Uh, number one, I'd just like to read this statement from Bishop Strickland about the uh, distribution of Holy Communion under the chalice. And he tells us, he says, due to an increase of the flu cases in the state of Texas, and in particular, the Northeast area, I think in all the United States, Tyler itself might be uh, the hot spot of the flu. He says, I want us to begin taking precautions uh, during the reception of the Holy Eucharist. It is important that we safeguard the health of our parishioners as best we can during this flu season. I therefore give permission to each pastor to temporar temporarily suspend the reception of the most precious blood during the Holy Communion. Therefore, uh, distribution of the Eucharist under the uh, species of wine, the precious blood, will be suspended until further notice. So uh, we will all, uh, for those of us who receive communion, Catholics and who are disposed, prepared, prepared uh, their hearts to receive, uh, we receive under the host, which the church reminds us that when we receive under the host, we are receiving the body and blood of Jesus, the body, blood, soul, and divinity. So sometimes, even I remember myself thinking until uh, someone who was, when I was in college, and someone who read the catechism very carefully uh, corrected my error. And my error was I thought that I had to receive both the host, I was to receive the body, and then to receive the blood of Jesus, I had to receive uh, the precious blood from, from the cup. But this is actually uh, not the teaching of the church. The church teaches that when I receive the host, I'm receiving the fullness, the body and blood. Or, sometimes there's people who have gluten intolerance and these kind of things, and if they need to, they can receive from just the chalice uh, and they're receiving not just the blood, but they're receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. So when we spend from time to time the chalice distribution, the chalice is suspended, no one is being deprived of anything. We're all those who receive are still receiving Jesus Christ in his fullness, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And as a matter of fact, receiving under both species is relatively new for uh, for hundreds of years, the church only distributed under the host because of that very uh, false idea that I had, that other people had uh, a long time ago, uh, that they thought you had to receive both to be fully receiving Jesus. So the church wanted to remind everyone, no, you don't have to receive both to receive the fullness of Jesus. So, so the uh, seniors, you won't have to, uh, until further notice, you won't have to worry about uh, being extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. The other announcement is that I don't have fish anymore because I am terrible at raising fish. I had this fish tank in my classroom and my last three fish, Hannah Claire, Cassidy, and Sydney, are no longer with us. So I'm going to stick to being a fisher of men. So I don't have a fish tank in my classroom. I just thought y'all would want to know that. All right, now on to the homily. <coughs> Today's uh, reading, we heard about Samuel. We heard the call of Samuel. He, he hears a voice, and he keeps thinking it's Eli who he's with. He gets up, he's like, hey, you, you called. He said, no, I didn't go back to sleep. And this goes back and forth until finally Eli says, Next time you hear this, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And we heard this during the vocations week. We heard this uh, during the uh, announcement time. This was one of the readings that was read. Uh, because a vocation is, is a call to hear God's voice. And I'm not going to speak about vocations specifically today, but I do want to talk about listening. Because you guys all have to do a lot of listening, right? You're having to listen to me right now, and that's probably, you know, amongst the many things, amongst all the listening you have to do, you're in class all day, now you're hearing me talk, and you're always in this position of what you feel like is passive. The speaker is active, and I'm in this 
passive situation here. But I'd like to make the argument that listening is a very active process. Perhaps if you've ever sat in a group of people who are speaking a foreign language, you would be familiar with that uncomfortable feeling that you should be joining in, but you can't. You feel like if you're not saying something, then you're not engaged in the conversation. I mean, even maybe if it's not a foreign language, if you're the one who's not doing much of the talking, maybe you feel like, oh, when am I going to get a word in? I'm not really actively participating in this conversation. But nothing could be further from the truth because we can confuse a silent process with an active process. But you can be silent, you all are right now, but you're all, it's very possible, not necessarily, it's hard to tell on the outside, but if you're silent, you can also be very active. There's a lot of activity going on. There should be a lot of activity going on right now, even if you're not moving and you're not saying anything. There can be a lot of activity going on in here, in the mind, and then hopefully that activity transfers here to the heart. So listening is a very active process. And so we have to get over that feeling, since you guys know, i got to do all this listening. Oh my goodness, I have to listen to these teachers all the time. I have to listen to Father preach all the time. And I, when I go to class, it's like i just got to get through this hour and a half period, and I'll just, you know, be passive and just wait until that period is up and then I made it through. But I'd like to talk about a few things that can help you, even in the most boring class, boring teacher, you know, that you can actually get more out of that. Because you can't change the situation, right? Your most boring teacher is your most boring teacher, or whatever. Your most boring class is your most boring class. You can't change that, but you can change your perspective on how to maybe get something more out of it, because you're there, right? You're going to be there. That can't change. Um, I mean, you can try to skip class and all those kind of things, but of course, you know, there's, uh, you know, and really, I tell people, you can do whatever you want to do, as long as you're willing to accept the consequences. But anyway, since you are there, we can try to make the most of it. So I'm going to go through a few things that can help us be more active listeners. Okay. So there's a lot of active listening techniques that we can use. Okay. And I want you to try these, just to, even as an experiment. You can experiment on your teachers. Okay? You might shock them. Okay? I mean, you might even make one of your teachers. If they see you doing this, they might pass out from joy or something. Okay? Because you know, it's because they might not have ever seen you do these kind of things before. So I dare you to try some of these things as an experiment. Okay? So number one, make eye contact with the person who's talking with your teacher. Okay? You, you will flatter your teacher to no end. You will make their day. Oh my gosh, so-and-so was just... And I can still remember from even, I remember my first year teaching here, two years ago, I can still remember the specific students by name who were the best at giving eye contact. And I knew that they were getting the most out of class. If you give eye contact to your teacher, then that's showing as an active way of listening. Now, I know that you are very good at making the argument about you can have your head down on your desk and it looks like you're sleeping and you're very good at making the argument, I'm still listening and I've heard everything you said. And for many of you, that would be true. I know that's the case. I've had students and then I say, well, look, what did I say? And they're able to regurgitate it back. Okay, it's possible. But if you're making eye contact, you're going to be much more likely to gain information that's being taught in class, or what I'm saying right now. Okay, so making making eye contact, and it's and even if you do it just as an experiment, I'm not saying you have to be interested in everything that the teacher's saying, or even that I'm saying right now. But just try it as an experiment, 
and see if you notice that, wow, I think I actually gave a little more information here. Even if you're not genuinely interested, just do it. <coughs> Experiment, okay? So making eye contact, that's one way. You're not talking, you're not moving around, but you're being very active, even if it doesn't look like it. The second, lean, lean forward slightly to show interest. And if you're actually listening, that should be, that should be natural, okay? You're sitting there, then you're... You know, and, and you lean forward a little bit, that shows that you are, you're getting something out of it. Now, when I've only been interviewed a few times for, I did, for the Dice I did a vocations video, and the person who was interviewing me would employ these techniques so that it would help give, and he would do this with everybody that gets interviewed, and a good, you know, reporter does this, because sometimes the person being interviewed, maybe you, you know, BGTV, Crew Weekly, you're on there, the person videoing video, video you, if they're not, you know, holding their phone, if they're able to be hands-free, if they're smart, they'll employ these techniques because they want you to look good, you know, people in the news, TV and all that stuff, they're going to employ these techniques so that it gives you more confidence. Because you're on TV, you might be nervous. So I remember when I was doing this interview about my vocation stories on the diocese website, and that's what the person uh, videoing you would do. And he would... And, I don't know, I don't think I was really that amazing. It didn't matter, you know, how whatever I was talking was interesting or not. Because he was employing those techniques, I thought, yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is important, but it got me more excited, it gave me more confidence, and I could, I could speak better in front of a camera because someone was listening to me and they were interested, or at least they were showing it. Okay, so that's a great thing to do, and not just, I'm talking about class time or mass, but also just with your friends. It's a common uh, courtesy to do this in making eye contact Leaning forward a little bit, you know, you're, you're kind of on the edge of your seat about this. Again, if you're not interested, try it as an experiment. Even if you're being a little sarcastic about it, I think your teachers will still appreciate that. Okay, so making eye contact and leaning forward. And then there's nodding your head slightly. It's a very simple thing. It's a very, you know, basic thing. Not a lot there to it. Just but it's, it's engaging yourself in this, this conversation, and you're not saying a thing, but you're already doing these three different things. You're being extremely active, okay? And then, I know some of my freshmen do this, and sometimes they're being sarcastic about it, but I don't care, I'll take it, it's awesome. They make, making agreeing noises, which I already kind of did with the leaning forward and back, I think. Hmm. Hey, yeah, there we go. I'm talking about. You're allowed to do that. That's great. You guys are engaged. I like it. They're just so, they're just on the edge of their seats with everything I'm saying. See, you're making me feel good about myself, you know? I'm entertaining. Yeah. Okay, so those are, we got eye contact, moving forward, nodding your head, making the green noises. And then, of course, the don'ts. The only don't in here is just not looking distracted by fidgeting or playing your phone or looking off into the distance. I did this one time in the seminary. I had you know, a fingernail that was just really bothered me and I was, I was picking at it. And during this talk that my superior general was giving when I belonged to the fraternity of St. Peter was at the seminary. And uh, he noticed it. So I obviously did not look engaged. I was, you know, And he even said something to me afterwards. He's like, oh, I guess you knew everything I was already saying. Wasn't that interesting, right? And I'm like, uh, no, it was great. It was awesome. You know, so, so doing these things, it not only shows the teacher, that's, that's one thing, and I know you're probably not too concerned about that, but it will actually help you get much more out of the class. Again, not, not that you want to necessarily, but you're there. These things, will, you'll be surprised, like, wow, I actually learned a lot more by employing these techniques that I that I have in the past by just trying to passively get through get through class. Okay. All that being said, we can apply this to our faith and to the master.
you know, just like the class could be boring, the mass can seem very boring as well. I kind of paused after the sign of the cross because I was going to almost do the sign of the cross again and said, let's try that again because I didn't hear much of an amen. I thought, well, I'll move on. Next time, I'll probably hold you to it. But uh, we, just like we have these techniques in class that I hope you try out, I hope you give your teachers those agreeing noises. Those are, that's probably my favorite one. It really gets me going, gets me excited. But we can also do this in Max. We have little things that we can do. You can do those things when we sing the homily. But you can also be, that's why the church has things like dipping your hand in the holy water that reminds us of repentance for our sins. John the Baptist, uh, giving baptism for the repentance of sins, for protection against the evil ones, sprinkling oneself with holy water. You're, you're blessing yourself. And the devil hates holy water. St. Teresa of Avila talked about that. She had this vision of the devil, she had some holy water, she sprinkled it at him, and he disappeared. He hates to be blessed by God, by Jesus Christ, through the priest. And of course, to remind you of your baptism, that's why the baptismal, the holy water fonts are at the entrance of the church, to remind you when you entered into the life of Christ in the church, in your baptism. Okay? We have the sign of the cross, you know, and sometimes you know, we do it, and hey, I'm guilty of it too sometimes out of habit, you know, all the time, just kind of, you know, little, little tiny thing. We should make a full, reverent, respectful sign of the cross. And because the deepest of our mysteries are contained there. Of course, the cross, we're saved by the cross of Jesus Christ. So when we pray, we're reminded of the cross, which saved us through the wood of the cross. Jesus saved us from our sins. And we should think of that, and that should be an opportunity to thank Jesus every time for the cross and his redemptive love. In the Eastern rites of the church, in the Eastern tradition, they do their cross, uh, we would say backwards, but they think we do ours backwards. But either way is a legitimate way. But they hold their fingers near the thumb and the index and the forefinger together. And then they have the other, the last two fingers over here, they hold them against the palm. And so you have three and two. So three is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the two symbolizes the divine natures of Jesus Christ. I mean, the divine, the two natures of Jesus, the divine and human. He's fully God and fully man. So the Trinity and the divine and human nations, and they sign, and they sign. We would go on our left, if I face it this way, on the left side first, but they do the right hand. And either way, as I said, is is legitimate, but from the from the right to the left, because the Jews are symbolized by the right side, excuse me, my hands going, can't talk without my hands. The Jews symbolize the right and the Gentiles the left. So when the faith passed from the Jews also to the Gentiles, that's what Epiphany is about. The Magi represent salvation is not just for the Jews now, but for everybody. And then we do from the left to the right, because the left is symbolic of misery and the right is glory. We go from misery to glory. Either way is, is a great uh, and a fine interpretation. And of course we have we have genuflecting because we truly believe when we genuflect, we're not genuflecting to the altar, we're not genuflecting to the cross and believe me, growing up, I didn't know what I was genuflecting to. I'll tell you right now, I had no clue. I did it because that's what everybody else did. We're genuflecting because we're in the presence of God. Like the Ark of the Covenant, that's where the presence of God would come in a cloud in the Old Testament, and only the high priest could enter there because it was so holy. Well, that tent was called the tabernacle. Why? Because the presence of God dwelt there. It was so holy. A tabernacle, tabernacle in Latin means a tent. Here is a tabernacle. The tabernacle, which is the fulfillment of that tabernacle in the Old Testament. So we genuflect because in that golden tabernacle, the presence of God dwells there. So that's where we're genuflecting. Okay? Uh, folding your hands, beating the breast, you know, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. All these gestures are made to help us more actively participate. So remember, just as you can be actively listening, very simple gestures that I told you, they will make a world of a difference. Again, even as an experiment, even if you're not interested, that's why we have these gestures at Mass. They are also meant to help us. That's why the church doesn't, I know sometimes people are clapping and, and jumping around and things, and, and that can be genuine. That can be a genuine way of worshiping God. 
but it can also be self-centered. I don't know how else to put it. But if we're centered on ourself, then, then our gesture is not helping us worship God. But folding the hands, the sign of the cross, the genuflection, it's taking us out of ourself to adore God. And so we should, if we feel like we have to do extra things, then we have to think, do the things that I'm already doing have meaning? And we should reflect on that. So as we continue with this liturgy, let's take advantage of those signs and those ways of actively participating in the Mass as we actively uh, participate in our class. I'll conclude with this thought. The Magi. They're adoring Jesus. They're there. They've come to find the Savior of the world. And they finally get there. And they see Jesus. And they see Mary. And they see Joseph. And they're there. And they, they kneel down. And they're in silent adoration. They're not doing, from the external observance, they're not doing anything. But they couldn't be more actively engaged on what is going on. They're in the presence of Christ. They're adoring Him. They're listening to Him. That is why, my friends, silence is golden.